Welcome everybody. This is going to be our last uh, CITP speaker series luncheon of this fall season. Um, we're welcoming Joanna Bryson today. Mm -hmm. She's a visiting fellow here at CITP and she is a reader uh, associate professor at the University of Bath and she will be speaking on technology, publics, and public goods <laughs> investment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Nice to be here. I will go quickly just to say that this work was conducted with a couple of my postdocs, uh, well, the, the work in the middle, um, which is the public goods investment work. All right, so first of all, what is a public good? The, the sort of rough idea is that it's something that no one in particular owns. The more formally, it's something that no one can defend themselves as private property. So there's actually a range of things that are semi-public goods as well, things that, <clears throat> like you know, your front yard. Um, but anyway. Let me give you a few examples. Normally, people think of things like basic infrastructure. So, you know, how do people come together and order th organize things like bridges or trade routes or something like that? The internet can be thought of as a public good, even though it was obviously, as you guys know, set up by particular people who have spent money. But, but the extent to which we can all use it is partly determined by how we all treat it, as most of the talks of the series uh, go on about. Um, the, uh, the environment is a new and trendy public good about which I'll come back. Another thing to think about is sort of uh, public health. So whether or not you immunize your kid affects the other kids, like what they catch. Um, privacy and trust are things that you don't usually think of as public goods, but I'm hoping we can talk about that towards the end of this talk, because I think that kind of brings it back into the relevance of what's going on with uh, technology policy. And also the things that, I, that brought me into this entire area was questions about why are humans the only species that have language and massive built culture and how do we share information and there are altruistic aspects of that so I'm giving away information right now why do I do that so that was the kind of question that brought me into this area in the first place um, so back to this let's think about a few basic questions we might want to ask how do we maintain investment in public goods? So if no one's particularly defending them, and, if, and you know, okay, there's a few police around the place, but that's extremely expensive. How do you get people to keep investing in something that they may not get the rewards from? Who does get the rewards? Who benefits in a complicated uh, public good? And uh, the, the question that I ask that a lot of people take for granted is how much should we invest? All right, so that's sort of the new piece how do we decide how much we should invest in a public good? All right. Um, why does this matter? Uh, well, as I just sort of mentioned before, one of the things humans are seen in is, is hyper cooperative. All right. And we, there's been things like humans for millions of years, but about 10,000 years ago, something amazing happened. This is a log plot. Okay. So even with a log plot, you see it just going unbelievably exponential right here. So we're winning in some sense of win. Uh, and the question is, uh, why? Right? And one of the answers is thought to be, well, cooperation. But what about us? What about us makes us special? Well, sometime uh, 10,000 plus or minus two years ago, we invented agriculture, 2000, sorry, <laughs> years ago. Um, <laughs> so it's between 12,000 and 8,000 years ago. Um, uh, we started urbanizing. And uh, Harvey Whitehouse thinks the key thing is doctrinal religion. We started trying to get everybody into our religion instead of having religions be little secret clubs, uh, as they still are in some parts of the world, like Papua New Guinea. Um, I think the key thing is writing, and I'll show you why on the next slide. Um, but these all happened at about the same time. Oh, not the next slide, sorry, slide after this one. <laughs> Let me just quickly, to set up that slide, talk about intelligence. So I don't know if everyone here knows this, but the main thing I do is artificial intelligence. So I'm very interested in that. And I'm going to use a very simple functionalist definition here, which is just the capacity to adjust action expression to new contexts. Okay? That's super simple. Cognition is sort of second order intelligence, right? So it's that some species but not others are able as individuals to adjust what um, to adjust their intelligence to, to learn basically. All right, sorry, sorry, people there. Um, and now, uh, how many people know about the super, who's heard of super intelligence before? Who's heard of the singularity? Who's heard of the intelligence explosion? Okay, <laughs> singularity is, uh, um, 
Yeah, it may be that uh, Nick Bostrom's uh, a bigger deal in the UK than here, and he's, been, he's uh, promoted the idea of superintelligence, but a lot of the people who care about it a lot are Americans. So did you guys hear that Elon Musk and a bunch of other people just said a billion dollars would go to developing open AI, right? And did you guys hear about Toyota investing a billion dollars in AI about, uh, I don't know, was that two months ago? It was a big deal when they said they were going to invest 60 million. And Gil Pratt, the guy who's in charge of their new academic institute, said there may be some more money in the works. He didn't really hint, like, that's such understatement. Oh, it's a billion dollars beyond the original 60 million. OK. So we'll talk about that a bit again towards the end. Anyway, the superintelligence is sort of a postulated, postulated consequence of machine intelligence when they learn to learn. The idea is that when that happens, suddenly, the, since you guys are familiar with it, the singularity happens. It goes beyond what humans can control. All right, so that's, that's the idea. Bostrom has made the interesting point uh, with uh, the orthogonality thesis that so people said, but we control AI. We build it. Why would, it. why would it take off and do something strange? And he said, look, even if you control the primary goals, as long as you're letting it learn about the sub goals, those might do something devastating, like turn the world into paper clips or something while you weren't expecting it, kind of Ice Nine-like. But he, little, he chooses uh, paper clips, not Ice Nine. All right, so back to that 12,000 years ago. If you can accept that intelligence can be decomposed, right? So I just said something about um, uh, controlling action uh, uh, as appropriate to context. But if you can take that into little pieces, all right, and one of them is memory, then that's why I think writing made all the difference. So I think 10,000 years ago, we were able to uh, start recording our ideas so we could come back to them. And the advantage of this, <laughs> <laughs> the advantage of this is that um, we can have more novelty. So as soon as you have the capacity to, uh, to remember um, what you were doing, then you can explore more. Basically, in a, on, how many people do genetic algorithms? Uh, OK, not too many. People think that the big problem is innovation. It's not. It's remembering the good tricks. And that was the, hard, that was the first billion years of uh, evolution, was, was getting something that could, that could that could innovate at all because it could remember the stuff that it shouldn't forget, like how to reproduce, right? So, okay, so that's, I think 10,000 years ago that happened to human culture and that's why we had this explosion. Before that, we were using the same axis for like 1.5 million years, right? So, it, things with bigger heads than humans. Can you imagine that, that little bit of lack of innovation? All right, so my, my argument is that artificial intelligence has been here for a very long time and what it effectively does is enhance human power and what's special about humans. So. What was special about humans um, was probably language, but AI is basically increasing our ability to, to, to communicate and to compute and to remember. OK. Do you, do you want to shut the door? The, 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 just the, uh, I'm easily distractible. All right. So yeah, so basically the intelligence explosion is us. AI enhanced humans. And that was what you just saw take off there. And it's not just because of the, the, this taking off. It's also because of um, what we're doing. So. We actually have more biomass on the planet now than we used to have before we started mining out uh, fossil fuels. All right. So this is, these pictures are all from Barnowski, uh, 2008, but this paper, I don't know how to say his name, but, but it's very good too, Haberl uh, et al., 2007. But anyway, um, again, these are, these are log plots. These are log years, um, log biomass in kilograms. So uh, human biomass has started down here and is shooting up here. Again, we have the sort of the, the 10,000 years ago um, thing. Uh, this is 1,000, sorry. This is 10,000, so that's a big thing. But as I said, this is, this is uh, log scaled. And the, the rest of the megafauna, that means animals you can actually see. So the bacteria are still doing pretty good. But we're just taking over what's on the surface of the planet, and we've actually increased how much stuff is on the surface of the planet. So this is what unsustainable means. Right, so we, if, unless we find another energy source. Um, right, so speaking of unanticipated sub goals, we turn extant biomass and fossil fuels into more biomass, but fewer species. Um, and of course, XK, XKCD does this really well. <laughs> so these are all the megafauna on the planet combined. The green ones are the wild animals, right? That's all the elephants there. This is in, in, uh, in uh, uh, mil megatons, all right? This is humans, this is cows, all right? <laughs> so we've just, we, we didn't mean to, but we've changed everything into us, basically. There's a little bit of stuff that, that's living at the corners. All right, 
So this is the kind of thing that I spend a lot of my time uh, working with in the UK, um, people making these kinds of claims. And it sort of drives me crazy, because <laughs> I don't think robots are the real issue. <laughs> I don't think being taken over by killer robots or worrying, and, and they don't all say that. Bostrom hates it when you, when you illustrate his stuff with the Terminator, which everybody does, right? But, but I think that um, we have bigger problems, and AI has been around longer than people have said. It's not some 60-year out threat. All right, this is the advertised talk, and now I'm going to get into that, back to the public good stuff. All right, so here's the public good, Amsterdam. How many people have been to Amsterdam? How many people want to go to Amsterdam? Yeah, okay. Right, but, well, you, you know, three meters, and, and if the water raises three meters, we can't go there. All right, how many people work on the problem of global warming? Yeah, okay, this is a lot of smart people. None of us really work on this, except for I keep using this slide. <laughs> right? All right, so why aren't we? We all agree that we'd like to go to Amsterdam, and we think it's a great city, and we like the Dutch, right? So uh, there, there are cities around here that would go under two, but I wasn't sure where they were, because I'm not from the East Coast, so I've, <laughs> I've kept the old slides. Sorry about that. All right, so the thesis is that when we talk about altruism, we talk about increasing investment in the public good, but when we talk about antisocial, we're actually talking about uh, increasing what, what biologists call direct benefit to the individual. So this goes back to the whole thing about uh, when you're on an airplane, uh, you know, and they say, you know, put the, your own oxygen mask on and then worry about your kid. And it sounds terrible the first time you hear it, but then you realize, you know, if I pass out, then we both die, right? So that's, that in, in biology, that's common. You need to worry about, there's multiple levels you need to keep going, normally speaking. And, uh, and you kind of have to, tr the idea, this is, as I said, a thesis, so the idea of this research I'm describing to you, it, these have to be traded off to figure out how to exploit optimally the, the, the available resources. So this is just the outline of the science part in the middle. So first of all, let's talk about the data. Okay, so um, if, you have p if you put people into a laboratory context and ask them, will, will you contribute to the public good? Um, basically, every place you go, uh, yeah, most, well, I'll, I'll show you the results. People do, all right? But they don't contribute everything they could. But then if you allow them to punish each other, most, most countries, most, these are actually cities, most places, uh, you will see punishment of those who don't contribute enough. But what varies a great deal, much more than that, is how much people punish those who contribute more than they do to the public good. All right, punishing philanthropists. All right, these, that means you're willing to pay a cost to penalize someone who gave you money. All right, all right. So that's the red here, and actually, uh, I don't know if everything's the headlines are so full of things right now. But anyway, this used to be topical. Athens, there, um, you can see these. Kind of, th this, this is when you're punishing someone who gave exactly the same amount you did. All right. So what's going on? Can you see the cities over here? I, the, this is not a large screen. The bottom one is Muscat, and the top one is Boston. All right. Uh, and yeah, so it goes Melbourne, Nottingham, St. Gallen, Chengdu, Zurich, Bonn, Kel Copenhagen, Dimitrovsk, is anyone know how to pronounce this, sorry. Seoul, D Istanbul, Minsk, uh, Samara, Rydia, and Athens, and Muscat. Okay. So um, how is this measured? Where do those numbers come from? Uh, the idea is that you play this thing called the public goods game. There's four anonymous players contributing to a common pool. Now, we don't really multiply it by three because these games are sort of expensive. This is what I'm going to be writing, uh, hopefully very soon, my uh, seed proposal about. Because we need money to, p play, to pay, actually pay people real money or else economists don't believe the results. And this was all done by economists initially. So, but we're going to use this. It's easier to describe it this way. Um, so the social dilemma is that uh, you know that if you put your money into the middle, I will think of it this way, for the four of you, if you all put all your money into the middle, into the kitty, then, uh, then you'd get three times as much money. So you might think, well, obviously, that's what you should do. But if you put every dollar you put in, because it's multiplied by three and then divided by four, you're only getting 75 cents back. All right? And so that's why it's called a social dilemma. You're, you're helping other people, because they all get three, three, you know, three quarters, but you uh, lose a quarter doing that, okay? And that is actually the definition of altruism uh, in biology and, and economics. Paying a cost to benefit others, all right? 
And the homo economicus prediction, which is the, the, the if, if people all acted exactly like economists thought they would, is that there should be no altruism, so nobody should contribute anything. All right, so what do people actually do? <laughs> it wouldn't be a story if, if, if economists got it right in the first place. Well, <laughs> right, you know, nobody would come in. Right? It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> all right, so, so basically, they, 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 they don't give them money. They give them poker chips, and then they tell them how much the money is worth. That's so that in every city you go to, it's worth about half a day's wages to play the game well. Okay, because that makes economists feel like it's going on. And it's much easier to reason about poker chips. So what do people do? They put in half of them. <laughs> they, they don't know what to do, right? So oh, I'll put in half of them. Hold on. They actually have to show that they understand all the consequences of their actions. They have to take a written test before they're allowed to play. So they do know what's going on, but they don't know what everybody else is going to do or something, and they invest in half. But if you let them play with the same group over and over and over, um, the, the, the um, contributions reduce over time. So what the, what the people who wrote the original paper said, well, clearly this is going to cross zero at some point, so this cannot account for human uniqueness or human cooperation. However, if we stick punishment in, um, oops, oh yeah, sorry. If we stick punishment in, it stabilizes it. There we go. That should have co-built. <laughs> so, so yes, I, I, as a computer scientist, I have trouble seeing why this is stable and that's not stable, but um, it is apparently stable. And uh, yeah, so and what is punishment? Punishment is you pay one chip to have three chips destroyed by front, and you, you don't know who these people are because they don't want you to be thinking about you know are you going to get a beer afterwards in the pub or something right? They they want you, they want it to be reputation free, just what you're doing to be you know rational. Um, so but what you do know is uh, how much they contributed. So you're saying that person who contributed you know three. I want you to take those. Th you know, I want you to take three off of them, and I'm willing to pay for that. Okay. All right. So, um, yes. Was this similar, but maybe a carrot instead of a stick, where governments like in the U.S. will let um, you donate money to charitable organizations and get a tax break? Yeah, that's that's kind of the reverse of it. Let's talk about it in, in, in Q and A. But it's a little different because we know people do this because they're angry. <laughs> so, so that I have a huge review article which is doing pretty well about this stuff, and, and actually, I, so we didn't do that research, but we found we, like a bunch of studies that show basically they do it because they're angry. I just want to show you the stability thing is freakier than we thought. Um, this is sort of an aside from this talk, but if you, Simon Gaekter, who's a great guy, he finally got enough money to to play it for 50 rounds, and the endpoints are the same, just slope changes. <laughs> so it's not, and they, they should have known that because. Uh, because uh, this is what happens if you change groups. So it seems like when you get into a new group, you start signaling somehow by playing more with the public goods investment, and then you drop down. Okay, but anyway, it's the, the, this is not what I'm going to explain. I'm going back to this data. So basically, uh, the first author. Uh, so remember, the first name was Gector and Fair, but now this new first, new first author, Herman, didn't believe when he heard this result. He basically, because he was a German who had been living in Russia, and he said, I don't think the Russians are going to punish people because they seem to let everybody off the hook. So I don't think they're going to bother to do this. He was wrong, but he was right that they behaved differently. Okay? So <laughs> they not only punished the people who didn't give enough, they also punished the people who gave a lot. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and so I've already talked about this, so we can go. Here's, here's the, the, the original research was done at ETH. So, uh, let's and the, yeah, here they are again. So they basically replicate that. I want to show you something pretty cool here, which is that this base, to, m to my mind, this, this basically breaks into three different strategies. So in, uh, it seems like in northern, northern Europe, as they call it, um, as soon as you read the new rules, you jump into a more cooperative uh, game. A bunch of people say, oh, the police are here. We're going to play a different game. All right. But in the, in the uh, former Soviet Union and basically the, the Middle East, Southern Europe, uh, you see that you neither have that slope to any great, except for Port Istanbul, the worst of both worlds. Right? So, but, but everybody else, it's, it's relatively level, except really interestingly, uh, in the Far East, including Melbourne, um, you find that they, they play the, first, the same first move, but then they discover the gradient. Right? So the punishment helps them up into that cooperative equilibrium. So why, why if these guys can find it, why can't these guys find it, right? 
All right, so one needs to explain this why anybody would do this. Why would you pay a cost to penalize others? Um, and secondly, why is it varying systematically by global region? Okay, so this isn't just random. If it was just random, you'd say, okay, this is just crap, you know, which some people say anyway. <laughs> right? But anyway, um, so that, that, those are the questions. I'm going to show you a couple of models. I don't know if you know this, if I said this before, I do agent based modeling. Um, I'm not going to show you this model, but just to tell you really quickly, I, again, as I mentioned, I was trying to understand the evolution of communication and why humans would share so much information. And it turns out that, um, you know, we have a model for this, but actually we were rediscovering something that had been known in the 60s, then discredited and then brought back into vogue. <laughs> so, um, but, but anyway, it, it turns out that you don't need tags, punishment, kin recognition, any of that kind of thing. All you need is that you assume that the mothers, that children are born near their mothers, that their behavior is sort of like their mothers, and that it takes finite time to move a distance. <laughs> Doesn't sound like any really ridiculous assumptions, but the mathematicians who are modeling this did something called a well-mixed population. In that case, there's no benefit to being altruistic. The reason altruism works is because you're more likely to benefit either yourself or people who have been communicated your behavior. All right, so that's called viscosity. All right, um, and we also showed separately, and we got this published. I mean, now it seems to me like this, this should be obvious, but not only us, but David Rand at Yale also published something about the same time showing that all these models that showed, oh, look, we can explain human cooperation, they didn't take into effect the fact that there's antisocial as well as altruistic punishment, and as soon as you introduce that, those models just fall apart. Okay, so, so <coughs> both it's not necessary and it's not sufficient to have punishment. So what is going on with the punishment then? So um, I came up with a theory, all right? This is a hypothesis still, uh, although it's, it's been printed in the review article, but we're still trying to prove it, and that's what the, the projects are here. Okay, so the appropriate level of public good investment moves faster than biological evolution can detect, and it's not detectable by one individual, okay? So therefore, you need some kind of plasticity, individual living within, uh, uh, learning within a lifetime, or, or at least learning faster than, than evolution can learn. And because of the second part, that not detectable by one individual, there needs to be some kind of socially communicated individual experience, and that's what the punishment is. All right, it's, it's one form of that. Okay, so subpopulations over and underproduce, and they come up with the right amount of, ex of investment. And punishment shifts individuals between populations, between whether they're overproducing or underproducing, all right? So that's, that's the main uh, hypothesis, that's the main model for this work. And just so you know, I didn't come up with it entirely myself. We found the same kind of system, uh, although this paper is still controversial too, but it's uh, in yeast. And you may be surprised to know that microbia uh, produce public goods, but they do. In this particular, they, they produce their, their housing, I and mean, basically they're only single cells, right? So everything they need, they have to excrete. And as soon as they excrete it, everybody else can use it too. So in this paper, they're, they're excreting digestive enzymes, right? No stomachs, just a single cell, right? You, it's, it, and <laughs> the enzymes are big compared to the cell, so it's very expensive to, to create these. And what you get is that some of them produce too much, and some of them don't produce any at all. And then they come up to optimally exploit what sugar is actually available, well, I'm sorry, what starch is actually available. They change it into sugar, and then they can absorb it, all right? So, and the, the two different populations, uh, again, this is another direction if you guys haven't done genetic algorithms, but there is something called evolvability. There, it is actually easy, easy to predict where sometimes mutations happen, well, easy. They're, they're reliable enough that you can shift between the two different strategies. And I can tell you the details if you want. I have other research about that too. Anyway, so, but in this case, we're not talking about punishment. It's just death. If the overproducers are outcompeted, so, that, so they can be invaded by uh, the, the ones who are free riding. But if, there, but if there's not enough overproducers, the underproducers starve. So that's why it comes to the right number. It's just simple biological uh, dynamics. All right, yeah, so those are those two. All right, so we built a, a model that was uh, uh, similar only in an agent-based model. They, they built it with actual yeast, and then they did mathematical equations. I said, let's just test it again in a spatial model. So we've replicated it. It's NetLogo. How many people know NetLogo? Yeah, okay, that's why it's little bunnies and bees. All right, so I, I could have made it look harder core, but it wasn't worth the time. All right, so basically uh, there's free riders, there's free food. 
if you don't put free food into your models, everything starves before it builds up a culture. <laughs> right? It's got to be some free food. But there's also better food, which is planted by the altruists. All right? If the altruists overinvest, um, then, then uh, they are, uh, then the free riders get to persist. So they, they survive, uh, but they never dominate. Even though in this case there's free food, so it's not like the other ones were needed, not like the bacteria, but still they don't dominate because there's a bit of an advantage to being an altruist, but it's not a big enough one to wipe them out. If the altruists invest intelligently, which is basically that they don't dig up the other plants when they're planting their own plants, um, that, that was sufficient so that the free riders can be outcompeted in this model. I hadn't expected it to be quite that easy. Uh, so anyway, uh, the, so we've turned off the smart public goods investment, and we have st stable coexistence. So if you can see down here, the, 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 the altruists are yellow, and, the, and the, the free riders are black. But it doesn't really matter. There's a little bit of a wandering there. But yeah, the, the, the bunnies go extinct. There's um, mutation, but they go, they go extinct. Um, if you if you put the smart public is on, all right. So so we've replicated that thing. Let's talk about what could be going on a little more interesting. Let's move it a little further. What if you could evolve how much you should be investing into public goods? All right. The um, what you do is uh, if you if you allow that to evolve to evolve. Oh, I'm going slow. Sorry. <laughs> when when do we we finish it now? Right. Yeah. I have one twenty. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Good. OK, so uh, right, so I better speed up a little bit. The multiple, basically, you get multiple peaks initially because everybody's just got some random value. But um, if there's only altruists around and the environment is stable, you know, surprise, evolution can find the optimal value. But if the, if the, op, if the environment fluctuates, then there's a dynamic range. Um, if there's still defectors, then uh, the lower peak is at zero. OK. so. So this is just the, the picture I just showed you. And here's it's a histogram of different values. And it's not, it's not like the, those points are special. It just keeps fluctuating. And this is the food. See, climate change. Climate change is turned on. <laughs> right? There we go. And, and so you get that. Um, if, there's, uh, if there are still free riders, then you see this, uh, that, that you actually have a whole bunch of individuals competing with the free riders by investing nothing. But you still get this big bump after a gap, which I find the gap really interesting, um, but there's a big there's a big bump out there of uh, uh, investment. All right, so that's just empirical; it's not very formal. Um, but we've basically uh, uh, replicated the Hamilton's law, um, and we've replicated the the McLean et al. And we understand why there's altruism. But again, this was about living and dying. So let's what what's going on? with the publishment is we think that there's basically the differences in group and out group. So if you think you're in the in group, then you're willing to invest. If you think you're with other people that you're competing with, then you don't want to invest and you start competing with them. All right, so let's see some uh, evidence of this. If you don't punish somebody, if, if, or if somebody playing the public's goods game, and now this is back to the original Herman et al data. We basically mined it. Um, if, if, if someone does not receive any punishment on the, on the previous round, they have an 80% chance of sticking with whatever investment they chose. And if they don't, it's just kind of noise. Um, and if they get antisocially punished, then they uh, have a 40% chance of sticking. So it's half. Um, and it's still random which way they go. So they change, but they don't change their particular direction. But if they're altruistically punished, um, it's half again, down to 20% chance of sticking. And they're way more likely to invest uh, more. Okay? Now remember, this was anonymous. So they don't even know if they've been antisocially or altruistically punished unless they're at the two extremes. And if we throw out the guys at the extremes, we still get this result. It's statistically significant. Okay, so what's going on there? I'll show you that in a minute. But let me just to remind you, this is that order. So boss, we're going to rotate this 90 degrees. In the first round, the pink down here is people that don't punish at all. The green is the ones who only punish uh, those who gave less than they did. And the, the, the top color is those who punish those who only punish those who gave more than they did. And the purple is those who punish both people who gave more and less. Okay? 
What this proves is that it wasn't just revenge. So one of the hypotheses that Gector and Fair said was they noticed there was some of this, but they thought, oh, they think that they got punished by those guys in the previous round, so they're punishing them back. So it can't be that. It can't explain all of it, although we know that does happen. In the final round, okay, now we're not going to play anymore. And this is, again, this, this thing about anger. There's, there is a lot of free riding on punishment, but look at all these guys. This is not instrumental, all right? So that doesn't explain it, although it may, it may be instrumental or at least inhibited. I think you're inclined to do it, but you, you stop yourself if you're thinking, I'm just throwing money away for half the subjects, but half of them don't. This is what it looks like in rounds two through nine, which I think are more important. I don't believe in endpoints. Okay, so the green means that in all of those rounds, the, you never did anything but punish those who gave less. And the, the pink means you never punished anyone, all right? Look, the purple is the mixed strategy, and the blue is the top, whatever that is. I think that's just an artifact. Remember, there's one in four of the um, group are the lowest contributors. So those guys only could antisocially punish. I actually think there's three strategies here. One is don't punish at all, one is altruistic punishment, and one is punish indiscriminately. So I think the antisocial punishment is actually just a side effect, which no one had thought that before because they all wanted to understand that. All right. So yeah. Some per I think what's going on is some personalities treat punishment as an opportunity to establish dominance, and they may uh, inhibit their antisocial punishment when they're in an in-group context, even if they are that so, so oriented. All right. Um, and the default assessment of whether you're an in-group with a bunch of strangers varies by ecological context. Okay, I didn't tell you something which I'm about to tell you now, which is that um, those the, that there's a correlation between uh, GDP, anti-correlation. So the richer the, the region was around the university that they did these studies, the more likely they were not to do antisocial punishment. Okay? All right, so you, you, do, you see more of this competitive strategy when you have less resources and also when you have lower rule of law. Okay? All right. So that was established but not explained by Herman et al. because there's a lot of ways, you, a lot of uh, just those stories you come up with that. So this is another hypothesis, which hopefully we're going to test in January. I found somebody with a little bit of money. So we're going to try to play, play this game. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's a very well-established paper uh, by uh, Van Lange et al. in 1997 where they showed that in the Netherlands, now these are the guys who are undergraduates, like the ones who've been in our study, um, in the Netherlands, there were three different orientations. So now, in this case, these are psychologists. So they don't believe you need real money. They just saw a list of, a list of uh, numbers. And the numbers, okay, here, there's two, there's, it's, a it's a table. So for each row, you have money that would come to you and money that would go to an anonymous other that, you've, that you'll never meet and they'll never find out who gave them the money, okay? So a lot of people in the Netherlands gave uh, chose the, the, the row that had the, high, the sum of the two numbers. That, all right, so he, they call those pro-social. Um, a, a, a fair number of people went for the biggest number for themselves and didn't care about the second number. You can understand that. They call those individualists. And then the small, but even in the uh, end case, that could have a big impact on society, it's, but it's diminishing, both of these diminish as you get older, apparently. Um, uh, they always, they were willing to pay a penalty to get a bigger difference with this anonymous stranger they'd never meet. They were that competitive that they didn't want to give money to someone else they wanted and they were willing to pay a penalty for that. Okay, in theory. Again, this isn't real money. But my hypothesis is that actually it is true, that, I mean, because I have a psych degree, I think it's actually a good result. And that the pro-social is lining up with the altruistic punishment. So <laughs> pro-social isn't necessarily hippies, right? <laughs> this is, they, they, these are people that are saying, damn you, <laughs> you, should, you should contribute to the in-group, right? Um, the individualists don't care what the other guys do, whatever. They're not going to spend money on someone else, right? And uh, so free riding on punishment, and, uh, and the competitive ones are the ones who practice indiscriminate punishment. And again, if you just look at these numbers here, that more or less lines up with uh, Bonn. Is there anybody Dutch here? Okay, I can sort of say it's mostly lines up with the German result, actually. <laughs> in case I were saying Dutch, I say you can imagine the Netherlands between uh, the Denmark and Germany, but really it looks quite like the, the German result. Okay, yeah, <laughs> there's somebody who works in here. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, 
so, uh, oh, also I should say, this, uh, this also explains how do you know that you're being uh, uh, altruistically punished. Um, because if you're going to be punished by these guys and those guys, they have a pretty good chance of being punished by two different people. And that might be when you think, oh, geez, I'm in an in-group because two people are beating up on me. Right? So maybe when you get punished by one, again, I, it's just a guess, but I, haven't, I need to check it against the data. OK, so, uh, so I'm, I'm guessing I need to go because, well, just, you can't get this idea. So probably this is going on. A lot of species, non-cognitive species may be optimized by changing the environment. Cognitive species might be able to also optimize group size. So we know that, pun that um, bullying reduces group size. So this may be a way to redire redirect investment towards uh, closer to the group. And you might want to do that in contexts where you're poorer because you just can't take as many risks if you're closer to uh, carrying capacity for that environment. All right, so what has this got to do with information technology policy? That's why I was zooming through here. Um, I mentioned uh, technology policies, at publics and public goods investment. So you could think of the sense of being in a group, in a particular group, as itself sort of a public good. All right, so maybe a public is actually defined by the goods of defense, and that's not just my hypothesis, that's something people kick around. Multiple group identities uh, for multiple goods and levels of investment. So why does that matter? It's because information technology uh, changes how we form groups, and people have talked about this a lot. With, uh, is, is it possible that information, uh, that the internet, uh, affects how we organize, uh, whether we polarize or radicalize. Um, so we have something which uh, we don't like. This is not the kind of technology policy you guys like to hear about, but the people that are worried about things like uh, uh, censoring and all these other kinds of things uh, could be concerned with, I, you know, this could focus down on what we're looking at for. Um, in particular, I already noticed that uh, Nolan McCarty has a, <laughs> a gap like this too in his voter data. Um, emerging right now, and it seems to emerge with greater inequality, which again, as I said, may have something to do with uh, when, when you get into these kinds of things. So, and also Karina Taranita has a um, model that explains why there'd be a gap there. So I hope we're going to like tie all these pieces together, but I don't know. Um, I have this really wonderful new result, which I don't have time to tell you about uh, to a great extent, but look, uh, if you model a different game, the trust game, it turns out that you, you get the most trust if you don't have too much information. You want to have a choice of partners, but not necessarily to know that much about them. And that actually allows you to evolve, not stably, I guess that's why we beat the game theorists to it again, modeling for the win. Um, it's not stable, but basically what you're evolving here is what you demand people to give back to you. The trust game is, I give you money. Um, because I know that you're going to be get the, the experimenter to give you a return rate again, you multiply it again, and then I hope that you give me money back, but you're not obliged. And again, people tend to do this even though there's no reason. And it, you know, because if you do it in one shot, you have no no way to, to do anything if they don't give it back to you. Um, so, but what we've shown is that both the rate of return, how what proportion of the money you give back, and the demand rate um, basically co-evolve with trust. And, but if you have too much information, there's no selection for trust. So there's no s reason for cooperation this way. And the interesting thing is that that drives return rate way to the top. Um, so, so that it's like you, you have to give almost all the money back or else the, the, the trusters won't trust you and you won't get to play the game anymore. Um, which I wonder if that's one of the reasons that we're getting, again, increasing equality in the places with a good internet penetration. So. Um, that's ne the next model to play with. Uh, a and IT more generally make perception and communication easier. All right, and so this is a paper, I forgot to cite it in here, I, I, that just came out this year, a book chapter. It may be that since all of a sudden this stuff came easier and we do have sort of uh, evolved predispositions about how hard we work on things, that this could increase our investment at the group level. And so again, this comes back to the privacy. Um, if, if, if everybody can observe everything we do, and if there's a lot of control at the group level, then there may be uh, less room for freedom and diversity. In the book chapter, I talk a lot about this thing about the over, overly uh, invested in tracking down every little thing your children do, parenting thing that's happened. You know, there's a massive increase in time that people are investing in parenting and, and the, the much less free time kids have. 
it's interesting that we're already seeing some adjustment to that. So Congress, which did almost nothing this last year, stuck in a thing about making it all right for parents to decide if their kids are, are old enough to walk home from school or not, which I don't know if they were, they, they, people were getting arrested for letting their kids walk home from school uh, in some states. So anyway, so we are already uh, working our way around that. But anyway, it, it, variation matters because without variation you can't uh, change, again, for those of you who know anything about evolution. So it re we really need to keep a diverse population if we want to be able to handle the fact that the world keeps changing. Um, so, but then the thing I actually expected to do here, and I'm still hoping to do in the, in the new year, is to look at whether we can help people to get over the hurdles of their expectations that were based in their lifespan. So if the, if the economy does change, uh, can you get people to believe in non-zero-sum games? Can you get them to understand these dynamics? Right? And that could actually be for going up or down, right? So, so people that live in North America tend to just, you know, this is over here, like we don't, we don't punish at all, <laughs> right, hardly. Um, but, but we also have a, so, so what we're actually trying to do is build some computer games um, and, uh, and we, of, the, uh, of the biology simulations and see if we can get people to understand at an implicit level. Like I said, they have to already understand the explicit level. They have to be able to write a test or else they can't play the game. But what we check here is that they um, can implicitly understand it. Does that make sense? I just realized I'm going fast, but I forgot I started at, at 1.30. Okay, because I'm now done. <laughs> I was motoring through and then it's like, ah. All right, no, I did not run long. Okay, so this is the summary. Uh, a and IT are altering human competence, and that changes the world, right? Going back to the beginning. And individuals need to be able to figure out how to regulate their own investment. We can't all do everything, right? Um, we have to choose what we want to do, and, and a lot of our inclinations about that may have been evolved. Remember those things that were happening even though they didn't make sense. Um, but concepts do change our perception, and our perception is what we act on. And AI can help us discover, and that's actually one of the things some people are worried about with the mining and the big data. We may discover concepts we never knew, and that may alter how we behave socially like that. Um, but anyway, uh, AI discovers concepts, in the, and in general, IT uh, allows us to communicate more quickly uh, concepts. So we have a way to change the world, hopefully better. All right, so why aren't we working on climate change right now? Well, we are. Maybe not you and me, but uh, the planet is. And we started to view the planet, climate as a public good, and we started to see ourselves as a unified public. And so that's the kind of thing we can do. Um, and I want to thank you for listening to all those words. <laughs>